All right, we're halfway there. <laughs> So six classes down! First off, I wanted to thank everyone who joined in to the series and subscribed to the channel. Uh, all the new people. I think my subscriber t count has more than doubled since I started the Crap Guide to D&D series. Thank you for that. But just so I don't burn myself out in the same way that I did with the Monster Hunter Crap Guides, I'm gonna take a little bit of a break. And that's what this video is about. Because I am currently in school, in university. You know, during the when I made the Monster Hunter Crap Guides, I was out of school. I had all the free time in the world. But right now, I have quite a few things on my plate, and also I am creatively bankrupt. I, I think that if I kept at the videos without any breaks, then they would dip in quality for sure, because these, uh, these Crap Guides are a, very, very different and a little bit more difficult to write for than the Monster Hunter Crap Guides. So as a little intermission, uh, I'm going to take a few weeks off of making the D&D Crap Guides. I'll return with the Ranger video uh, eventually, maybe sometime in uh, mid-February or something like that. But in the meantime, let's answer some questions that uh, I, I want to do a little Q&A because that's fun. The footage in the background, you will see me drawing one of my first characters, like my first actually made character for D&D, and he is basically my self-insert, my, my darkness dementia raven way, if you will. His name is Victor Quibbles, uh, also known as Rat, as, as his nickname that he goes by. He is a half-elf bard, and he is currently going through a rewrite and redesign because his original design as a half-elf rogue and, and backstory was just all messed up and I didn't know what I was doing because it was my first character. Even now, like his design, I'm just not so sure with it. He's got like a collar thing that goes up to his mouth, kind of similar to Gadiel, the uh, cleric who is another character that I'm going to be playing in a different campaign. I don't know why, I guess uh, I just gravitate towards uh, those <laughs> high collar mouth cover things. I don't know. Looks cute to me. Uh, before I go through all the hundreds of questions, uh, some frequently asked ones first. Will you be making a crap guide to DMing, races, and unearthed arcana classes? Uh, yes, yes, and no. So I guess this is technically not the halfway point because I'll be making two more videos, one on races, because I think uh, the races aren't that deep that I can cover multiple races in one video. And also DMing is such an important part that you gotta make a video about it. So technically the Ranger video should have been the halfway point, but I won't be making any videos on the Unearthed Arcana classes. So no Artificer, no uh, Blood Hunter, no Mystic, uh, n none of that stuff, because I, I don't think it's really that relevant to the general player base, and also because I have no experience, I am not familiar with them at all. So sorry to disappoint anyone who is looking forward to that. What is the avatar that you use in the videos? Uh, a lot of you don't know that I, uh, previous to the D&D crap guides, I made a crap guide to Monster Hunter, and that is the Wiggler helmet. And I thought it was hilarious, and that's what I used, and uh, that's why it's still here, because that's just part of the character now. Are the characters in your D&D crap guides the friends you play with, or are they your OCs? I guess they're all technically OCs. Uh, aside from Gadiel, the cleric, who is a player character that I'm going to play in a future campaign coming up run by Eric of the Hijack crew, uh, whenever that'll be, who knows. But uh, no, the rest of them, they're all made original for the series. So uh, somebody else asked that if they have like uh, personalities or characters or backstories. No, I, I just kind of made them purely for the series with just the barest, plainest, most obvious personality trait to give them for uh, all of the videos. But uh, it, it is pretty nice to see people <laughs> taking that into their own, making fan art and stuff, which I really appreciate. People have been drawing fan art. It's super cool. It is super awesome. What made you want to make D&D crap guides? How long does it take you to make them? Do you find it easier or more fun than the Monster Hunter weapons? It's definitely different. I would say it's more difficult uh, for several factors. Firstly, I can't just go out and play a monk when I feel like it. Not like with Monster Hunter where I can just pick up the charge blade if I feel like it and just play it. D&D requires more setup and there's a lot more factors involved with playing a class in D&D just because you can play it in so many different ways because it's it's not tied down by its rules. And that's why these videos vary in how long they take. The Bard video took two days to, to both write and make, partly because I was 
the most motivated, I think, at that point, because it was the beginning of the series, and also because I have plenty of experience with Bard being my favorite class, if you couldn't tell. So writing jokes for it and trying to also weave in what it's like to play Bard was really easy because I had a lot of experience. That's why Monk took a long time, because I knew nothing about Monk, and I still don't feel like I know a lot about Monk, so it took more than a week, and also because I have creation fatigue. Any good D&D stories? Everybody typically has at least one, and they're usually super interesting. Uh, funnily enough, no, not really. Not that I can think of. A great moment, but it was somewhat planned by the DM. But uh, yeah, I don't have as much experience with D&D as you would think. I've been playing for, I would say, three, almost four years, but the times that I have played are few and far between. Like, I've only ever finished one campaign, and it was a campaign that I ran. Yeah, if I can think of one, I don't know, I might make a D&D story about it, might not, who knows, no promises. Why do you think people like your style of videos, and is there something new you'd wish you to try on the channel? Yeah, I, I, I feel like I've got a good formula going. I had a good feeling that people would like the Monster Hunter crap guys just because people like uh, funny stuff, people like short stuff. Yeah, people like hyperbole and exaggeration and jokes. I do want to do more stuff, but I'll talk about that later. I'm just happy that people appreciate what I do right now. How did you get so cute? By tricking people into thinking that I am. How does one get their DM to stop delaying the game every week? Either you talk to them or you find another additional DM to play. Sometimes things come up and uh, maybe you talk to them and maybe there's not much that they can do about it. I wouldn't say drop them, but if you really are itching to play, uh, there's nothing wrong with finding another DM to play a different game. What software do you use to make your art and videos? To draw, I use Paint Tool Sci, and to edit, I use Adobe Premiere Pro. Have you guys ever thought about doing a Hijack D&D campaign for the channel? Yes, actually. That's something that we've always wanted to do, uh, just like the channel itself. For those of you who don't know, I am part of a group channel called Hijack, which you can go subscribe to right over there, where me and my friends just do random stuff together, including playing games, making videos about how we do our art, and we have been in the talks of uh, once we start another campaign about recording it and maybe posting it online. What art training have you had? I have been drawing since I could pick up a pencil and I've taken several art classes throughout my school years from kindergarten all the way up to graduating high school and now I am majoring in graphic design while doing illustrations on the side. What's your favorite race and class to play in D&D? Which editions have you played? Have you dipped your toes into any other tabletop role-playing games? Uh, as I said before, my favorite class is Bard. I don't think I really have one favorite race, I just kind of gravitate towards several. I guess design-wise, it's a tie between Half-Orcs and Tieflings, because I just personally uh, like them aesthetically. But to play, I've just kind of played all of them pretty equally. As for experience with D&D, I've only played 5th edition. I have played Starfinder a little bit, but aside from that, I don't have the biggest repertoire of stuff that I've played in terms, uh, in terms of tabletop. What's my favorite subclass? The Bardic College of Swords. Can we get a set tour? It looks like this. What initially got you into trying D&D? Well, a lot, like a lot of people, I got a kind of passing knowledge of D&D for the longest time. My freshman year of college, towards the end of the year, me and three of the hijack members that all went to the same college were walking along a hiking trail, and we were just talking about uh, what our fantasy character would be like, because we're a bunch of nerds and we like fantasy stuff. And, you know, we we were in the talks and um, Ian was the only one with a real experience with D&D. I had played kind of really stripped down homebrew versions with like who couldn't even really count as D&D and I didn't make my own character and I didn't know what was going on so I, I, I wouldn't count myself as someone who knew what D&D was even after playing a style of it, but Ian was like, yeah, I've played, I've legitimately played d and I can, uh, I can DM you guys, I can DM all of us. So we rolled characters, and, uh, we got really into it, and the rest of is history. So this one's asking about great stories, but it also asks about a favorite character, and I'm gonna use this opportunity to mention Storig, the half-orc bard that made me realize bard is my favorite class, I love discovering characters, and I love role-playing as someone who's not just an idealized version of myself. 
because Storig is he he's a real meek and and very kind and and timid and he always calls everyone by miss or mister before their name and he's just uh he's my favorite character because he's such a sweetie he everyone gets their turn before before he does he wants to open up a theater he wants to uh, play violin the violin that he was passed down from his mother he's just this sweet guy who just wants to help everyone he wants to stop the bullies stop the bad guys and just just do the best that he can and I love him. How long have you been animating? I wouldn't really call myself an animator per se because I don't do it on the regular but I guess I have dabbled in it uh, ever since I was a little kid like 11, 12, 13 just kind of doing you know flip notes and pivot if anybody remembers stick figure animations. I liked to use the flip note feature on the DSi just kind of every every here and there, you know, I would I would animate in some way. So I, I guess like 10 years I've dabbled in it. But only recently have I actually like tried to implement the fundamentals and learn how to make good animation. What was my first session of D&D like? A mess. <laughs> uh, I, I still remember it to this day. It was the entirety of the hijack crew. Thinking back on it, we did so many things wrong. And there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. I want to preface this by however you enjoy D&D, as long as it aligns with the rest of the, your group that you're playing with, there's nothing wrong with it. But it is not the way that we play now. It is especially not how I play characters. I had no idea. The reason why Rat is going through a rewrite is because I did not know what his character was back then. And I was just like, oh, he's going to be edgy. Oh, no, he's going to be deep and, and sympathetic. Oh, he's going to be suave and, and expressive and theatrical. I didn't, I couldn't nail down like a, a defining trait. And I was just trying too much stuff because, because I didn't know anything about character writing. Or, or playing how to be a good player in D&D, which is a skill set in its own. It was a lot of getting to know the game and a lot of waiting and wait, is that how that works? Oh, uh, what's a D12? And a lot of backseat DMing. A lot of like, oh, I got this nat 20. Th you should have this happen. It's like, just, just let the DM do his job. This one mentions about collaborating with Puffin Forest. I've had the pleasure of uh, talking with Puffin Forest and uh, Dingo Doodles and a couple of other D&D YouTubers. And you know, if something comes up, yeah, that would be loads of fun. If they ever have something in mind, that'd be great. And if they don't, that's fine too. If it doesn't happen, it won't happen. If it does happen, well then you'll probably see it somewhere, either in the announcements or on the channel or whatever. But I have been able to talk to them and they are just swell people all around. Super duper cool. I love their videos. It is an amazing feeling to <laughs> talk with uh, these people that um, you followed. Well, I didn't actually ha hear of Dingo Doodles before, but I have heard of Puffin Force. I recognize this art style like that but I do like all their stuff now. Who dat cutie tiefling? Her name is Felicia, it's right there. I am super happy that people have taken a liking to my character designs though. And I am super happy that the bard video is the most successful one because bards are the best. What made you want to start making YouTube videos? Well, like a lot of kids uh, growing up with YouTube, I just kind of saw, hey, that looks fun. That looks like fun. Those people look like they're having a lot of fun making videos. And also I've always kind of enjoyed entertaining people. I was never the class clown, but uh, I, I did like presenting, not presenting like in class, but I, I liked anything that involved presentation. Things that I could make them flashy. Although, funnily enough, I was pretty good at presentation in school, even though I had the shakies every time I did it. But yeah, I, I just like performing for people. I never took a theater class, but I, I just like, you know, entertainment and producing entertainment, making art for people to enjoy, or just making stuff that I enjoy. If people like it as well, um, then it's a big, big bonus. I honestly don't think I could handle making uh, so much of this stuff to this degree purely for someone else with no enjoyment from me. When will you admit the lance is the best weapon in Monster Hunter? Also, what really inspired the start to a Crap Guide 2 series? Crap Guide was inspired by a lot of things, really. Uh, just kind of satirical guides in general. A lot of you may already know uh, that Zero Punctuation and Scott Falco's A Side of Salt series are a uh, big draw. Also, the arrogant nature of the Crap Guidesman character comes from Master Chief from the Arby and the Chief series, kind of drawing inspiration from him, how he's like this elitist asshole who kind of puts people down and, you know, believes that his opinion is the best one. And also, Larry Zauer's basically Final Fantasy XIV classes series. And I will never admit that the lance is the best weapon. It's pretty good, but it's no sword and shield. What is my second favorite weapon in Monster Hunter World? The light bow gun. What originally started your interest in drawing and animating, and what advice 
advice would you give to those trying to do something similar? So I said before that I've been drawing as long as I can remember, so nothing really inspired me to draw. I just started drawing because as a kid you try everything, you know, when you're a little toddler. You do everything and then everything you do your parents are gonna be like oh, they're gonna be a professional that when they grow up so like if you kick a soccer ball they're gonna be like oh, they're gonna be a sports person when they grow up and it's like no they're just you just try stuff when you're a kid and i guess i just stuck with doing art the biggest satisfaction i guess for me is sometimes whenever there's something that i want to exist but it doesn't yet I have the ability to do that. I have the ability to create whatever I want exactly to what I want it to be. And that is the best feeling in the world is to have that ability. That's why I like making all this stuff because it's like, oh man, I really want this thing to exist, but it doesn't. Well, then I'm going to go do it. <laughs> My best advice is to just do it. Just if you want to draw or animate, just start doing it in any way that you can. Don't wait for an excuse of like, oh, I need this program or I, I need this this uh, drawing tablet, like, it helps, it definitely helps, but nothing should stop you from, from doing it in any way you can. I made an animated music video when I was like 14, and all I had was paint and Windows Movie Maker. And you're asking, oh, does that mean you had to like copy and paste and reorient the characters and draw them like for every single frame of animation? You bet I did. So just keep doing it and never stop. It's gonna take you a really, really long time to get to where you're satisfied. And even then, once you reach that peak and you can look back down and, and get, be like, yes, I, I made it really far, then there's gonna be another mountain to climb and, and reach another peak. You'll never fully be satisfied. And that sounds kind of discouraging, but it's true, like, because we're always improving, you will never reach perfection. And once you do reach one peak point where you're like, okay, I I've started to plateau a little bit, then you start learning about the fundamentals, taking a class, reading some books, looking at some tutorials on YouTube, learning the rules. And then that's when you can grow even more. Because yes, you can go fully self-taught, but I think it really helps to learn the actual rules that have been uh, established and set by the masters and the professionals. It's like science, you know? If everyone had to invent their own telescope before they could explore the stars, then, you know, we wouldn't be anywhere. It's okay to piggyback off of other people's discoveries and, and rules and, and things that they've learned and established over the years. In fact, it is encouraged. But yes, do it and keep doing it and don't stop. You're gonna suck at the beginning and you're not gonna stop sucking for a long time, but eventually it's gonna suck a little bit less. Will we see a continuation of overly edited Dark Souls? Yes, on the Hijack channel, go watch. Any particular homebrew rules that you use often? Just like some minor ones here and there, like how certain spells work, how padded armor doesn't give you disadvantage on stealth. Yes, padded armor gives you disadvantage on stealth, funnily enough. I do like to homebrew magical items because I just like to make them really, really interesting and, and unique and not just plus one to this. An example is an orb of spell slots where I actually don't don't remember what it was called originally probably not that but I'm just gonna call it that from now on but basically what it did was you had you were able to store a spell any spell that you wanted from your uh, prepared spells list and it would get rid of all your spell slots in the level of that spell so let's say it was a cure wounds right so that's a first level spell so you would lose all your first level spell slots now you would store the spell in this orb and what you could do is you could cast that spell that you stored in there at any level you wanted. You could use it once a day and whenever you rested and regained spell slots, the spell stored in the orb would reset. It would get rid of the spell. Now, that's a little bit overpowered, obviously. Uh, I think I would have to do a little bit more balancing, like lose half of the rest of your spell slots or, or something like that. That's just an example of the kind of magical items that I would make. I would make them super broken and very different, like have their own mechanics to them. Another one was a sonic backpack. So it was a dwarven backpack that you put on, uh, when, whenever your health went below half, it would emit a thunder wave, like the spell thunder wave. You know, th things like that. Things that are more than just adding stats to you. I don't like using homebrew classes or races just because they're just not tested and can so easily be imbalanced. And also be because, like, there's so many different combinations and possibilities of the 
official races that Wizards of the Coast have released already that they can fit pretty much any archetype that you want anyway. So like, you know, if you want to be like a samurai, then they have a samurai archetype. If you want to be a pirate, well, then you could be a College of Swords or you could uh, use a rogue and go swashbuckler or something like that. Which I guess, just to go on a tangent, some advice for new players, don't be completely set on trying to fill this this perfect image of the character you want to play. Like, be, be willing to compromise a little bit just to fit into the rule set and also to discover a, your character a little bit. Matt Colville, dungeon master and level designer for video games, um, has a fantastic series of videos uh, called Running the Game, gives a philosophy that I agree with that, um, you know, you should never be hard set on anything as a player or as a DM. D&D is all about compromise. You know, if you want to recreate your anime superpower mecha warrior look at the the rules that are available to you first before going to DD homebrew wiki and finding the mecha warrior class because odds are there's so much in the official rule books that you could cobble something together that fits pretty well and is balanced and tested how have i been tired PS4 or Xbox. I'm not brand loyal. I'm there wherever the games are. What's the next project you plan to tackle after a crap guide to D&D? Well, I mentioned before that I want to make a long, long form video uh, in the vein of the Klonoa video on Mystery Dungeon, uh, based on the votes winning. I will still make uh, other stuff and I'll make the Reach video afterwards, but yeah, long form stuff like that, just other videos like uh, more overly edited and more CCC. I want to make music, maybe do some animations, I don't know, animated shorts, just a bunch of stuff. Maybe the third season of Crap Guide could be other things as well, like Crap Guide to Pokemon types, or just non-gaming stuff as well, like Crap Guide to Marvel heroes, maybe. I don't know. A lot of things I want to make. These are not promises for any of those, though. How do I feel about min-maxing? I feel as though that as long as it is in line with the group's philosophy on gaming at the table, then there's no issue. I don't give a goddamn how anybody plays the game so long as everyone at the table is having fun and it doesn't deter anyone's fun. If every, if people at your table are okay with playing like Critical Role, then great. If the people at your table make sure to not play like Critical Role, then great. Just remember, D&D is not about comparisons. How you play is going to be different fr from how anybody else plays, and that's fine. It's just important that everyone's having a good time. Because if you're not having a good time, then the saying goes, bad D&D is worse than no D&D, because it can feel like a big waste of time. So find a group that aligns with you and how you want to play and how they want to play. If there are issues, talk it out. Please do talk it out. You'd be surprised how easy it is to, to talk through these problems and come to an understanding. And if it doesn't work out, well then step away from the table, find a different group. No hard feelings. No one is better or worse for playing in a different way. I personally don't min-max. I am a player who enjoys the story and the role-playing aspect and occasionally combat, but like, you know, whatever. That's just how I play. How did you get your drawing style? Practice, iteration, bitterness, resentment that it looks like somebody else's. What is my favorite game of all time and what was the first game I truly beat? Oh, that's a tough one. I guess the first game I actually beat was... I don't know. I've played games for so long that it's hard to think back which one I did. One game that stacks up against all the others in like full package, like all together, is still gotta be Shadow of the Colossus. Like sure, there are probably aspects of other games that I like more than certain aspects of Shadow of the Colossus, and sure, there might be games that I would prefer to play more than Shadow of the Colossus, but just like as a, a symbol of, of gaming and as a piece of art, it still holds up as one of my favorites. Hear me out, Crap Guide to Smash. Okay, so <laughs> a lot of people have been asking for that, and uh, I'd be lying if I, I didn't entice me a little bit. And it would be easier to write for and capture for than Crap Guide to D&D, because D&D, I can't really find enough B-roll. It's hard because it's not, a, it's not a video game, so I have to draw things. Each episode of Crap Guide has around 100 drawings, and also I can't just pick up and play a class like I can with a video game. With Smash, I could. The only problem is there's freaking 70 characters. I would have to dedicate more than two months to that, and, and I, I don't know that I have it in me to do that. Maybe in the future, maybe I could lump them together, but uh, right now, it's not 
<laughs> it's not in the works. It's not. I don't have it planned. Crap Guide to Final Fantasy XIV? Larry Zauer already pretty much made crap guides to them. And also, that would also... I would have to level them up all to level 70, kind of get to know them, know the culture around the game and the in-jokes and all that stuff. And it's just, it's just too much. MMOs are too much, man. If I could do anything with no constraints, i.e. no need for money, energy, everything goes right, what would I do and why? I would make an animated feature-length film or animated series of either some kind of fantasy, like a D&D style sort of thing, which I know it's super original, right? But I just, I've always wanted to do that or make a game, make my own RPG, my own action RPG, like a real time, just like hack and slash with the best character creator and, and just like awesome multiplayer features and just a big open world with great customization and, and a transmog system so you could hunt for that fashion because every game that has customization fashion is the end game it would have every weapon under the sun it would have every just just everything it would have everything it would be the best rpg the combat wouldn't make you want to jump into a well because it would play like a video game it would be well animated it would have it would have a really beautiful art style and who knows maybe once i'm like 60 and can get a team together uh i can make that game and finish it when i'm 70. have i ever played transistor yes i love all the super giant games i hope to play pyre one day because it looks super awesome i love their music i love their art style i love everything about them i am a super giant fanboy what is my video slash creative process i look up a few guides for the class that I'm writing for. I kind of jot down, okay, all right, they do this thing. They have, you know, these features. I, I try to make jokes out of it. I look up some guides, some actual guides, like either, there's one that, that's been very, very helpful for me. And is also pretty, pretty funny in his own right. And that's uh, Davy Chappie, Davy Chappie? Davy Cappy? Davy, Davy Chappy. And he has been, ma he makes like bite-sized videos that have really, really been helpful. I also watch Don't Stop Thinking, How to Be a Great Game Master slash Player of, you know, Bacon Battalion RPG, whatever they're called. Just look up Matt Mercer GM slash DM and you'll just find a ton of stuff. So, so I, I listen to those guides and then the most difficult and longest process of coming up with how to make it funny. Uh, having experience helps. The reason why the Bard video took so little time and why it's probably one of the stronger ones and a lot of the jokes resonate with people who play Bard is because I play Bard a lot so I know how to write about a Bard and that's why the original cleric video not the one that's uh, available right now the one that's unlisted was so bad and misinformed because I had no experience with cleric no proper experience with cleric so you know you write what you know and I knew jack squat about that that's why monk took so long is because I wanted to get it right I'd never played monk I know so little about monk aside from the stereotypes but stereotypes does not a good video make because they might be wrong as shown with the cleric video then I write it and then I proofread it, I make some changes, then I record it. That one takes a little bit of time because I stumble over my words, I have to talk fast, I have a, a stutter, and just to get the right tone for, for everything. Recording sessions can take uh, between 6 minutes to 8 minutes to upwards to 15, I think was the longest one, just trying to get the lines right. And then the most tedious part is drawing the, the, the different panels slash frames for what I'm talking about. That part requires kind of a little bit of creativity, and that's kind of when my brain starts to die and I just, just throw in random references. It's not necessarily hard, but making all these so many drawings. It's satisfying when it's finished though. And then of course I make any few changes and additions and additional recordings so you might notice some of the episodes have a change in my quality just because I thought of a, a better joke or I cut out a joke because it didn't work. And then I, I watch it through and then if it looks good I upload it. How about a video on your honest opinion on D&D or Monster Hunter if you haven't already? I'll do that once the series is over because that's kind of what I did to with the crap guide to Monster Hunter. I'll give my real thoughts on each class and aspect of playing the game once the series is over. How have you been dealing with the sudden boost in popularity? Hope you're not too stressed out. I was stressed out when I was at 10,000 subscribers. Of course, obviously, there are some expectations that come from me now that I have a big following. People are going to want me to make more crap guides. People are going to want me to make more D&D stuff. People are going to want me to make 
things that they came for in the first place. And it, it has, you know, it, it is a little stressful. And of course, uh, it, it does kind of irk me a little bit that this is not the one thing that I want to continually do with the channel forever. And again, I'll talk about that later, but um, it, it is nice to have so many people appreciate your work. It means a lot and it's done great things for my self-esteem for sure. And it has changed me. It has definitely changed me. Like, it's just natural for you to be a different person day to day as you grow and, and change. But I am a very, very different person than I was five months ago when I started the channel. For better or for worse, I guess we'll just have to find out. But if I ever go down the evil route with my channel, doing something like response videos or starting drama or just not being cool, you have full permission to come slap me, every single one of you. It has been nice kind of talking with and, and learning about all these content creators that I've followed and appreciate and look up to, like hearing of my work and that they like it, you know? I, I got to I got to talk with so many cool people as a result of this. I've met so many cool people, not just content creators. I made friends. I've made all these connections. I've learned of so much. It's a little bit of a shock, actually. Somebody mentioned something else about uh, homebrews, and one, one, there is one homebrew that I always, always like to use personally. I, I know other people, they, everyone plays different, like I said before, and it's okay to play different. But one, just to like reduce player conflict for me is I go with the rule of player consent in that if one player wants to do something conflicting with another player, if that other player says, no, you don't, then it doesn't happen. So like, like if someone wants to steal from somebody else, uh, or like someone wants to hit someone else, or like, uh, do a roll, like I, I don't allow rolling against each other or anything like that unless both players are in agreement because um, I have played with some people where there was some conflict and drama in the past and I, and you could tell that, that they weren't doing it because they were trying to play in character or, or add to the story as much as they would argue that that's what my character would do which is a cop out. So I make the rule if I try to steal from you and you don't want that to happen, and you say no, then it doesn't happen. I think that cuts down on a lot of drama at the table. But maybe you like that. Uh, like I said, everyone plays differently. I'm re-recording this just to be clear. I mean when two players steal against each other. I don't mean as in like stealing against an NPC and them needing wanting to talk it out and like stopping each other from acting. No, I mean like stealing from another player. Why Sword and Shield is good. Watch this video which is copyrighted because music. Sorry, there's nothing I can do about the ads. Am I open to doing commissions? And if so, what prices? I'm not open right now, but I am currently kind of developing my own website where you can see my commission prices and, and stuff in my portfolio. And I'll announce that when, I guess, when it's applicable, when it's finished. It is under construction. And also I'd have to figure out how to funnel everyone who would want to commission me. I don't think it's super arrogant to say that uh, I'm gonna get be getting a lot of them if I open them up. It would have to be when I'm very, very free, or I would have to limit it to like 10 at max, even, maybe even less than that. <laughs> I'm scrolling through these comments and these questions. There's so many questions asking, what's your favorite race? What's your favorite class? I mean, obviously you don't know, you know, that the other comments have already asked it. It's not your fault, but it's just kind of funny. What game franchises are you really invested in? Or rather, what series do you regularly enjoy? What sort of genres do you prefer? I really like shooting shooters of any kind, my favorite being the Halo series, and I did dabble in a little bit of, of Call of Duty. I was a Call of Duty boy. And I do really, really like RPGs, specifically hack and slash. I like anything that has a lot of customization. I, I guess uh, my favorite series that I like to follow are Halo, uh, Pokemon, the Ratchet and Clank series. I really like the Jack and Daxter series, Saints Row, my favorite one being Saints Row 2. I also really like platformers, uh, Shovel Knight being one of my favorites. I don't know, I, I just like a lot of games. There's a lot of games that I like. Those are the quickest ones that come to mind, I guess. What type of person do you think D&D is best for? I think anyone can enjoy D&D. Literally anyone. I, like, I, I firmly believe if you have an imagination of any kind, you will like D&D. Because everyone likes to talk about hypotheticals, right? With their friends, like, oh, what if we did this? It's like, oh, that would be so funny. In D&D, you can, albeit in your mind, but 
you can do it and it is the closest form of it being real and actually doing it as you can so it doesn't matter if you're a dude bro it doesn't matter if you're 7 or 70 i firmly firmly believe everyone can get into DD if they find the right group in the right campaign and just the right character or any any of those factors individually or together because we all like using our imagination and we all like being with our friends and hanging out well to different degrees. Even if you derive joy from ruining other people's fun, you can play with a group that, and play in a campaign specifically made so that you could mess with each other. Because there's so many different ways to play, it can suit literally anyone. How many YouTube channels have you attempted to run in the past? Five. Have you heard of Girlfriend Reviews channel? I have! They're one of my favorite new channels that I've discovered recently. I am jealous that they are way funnier than I am. Oh, and that's all the questions that uh, I thought were worth answering and weren't repeats of other questions. I did scroll through all 450 comments on that uh, announcement, so I hope that uh, that was satisfactory. As I said before though, I'm going to be taking a little bit of a break just because school has given, been a little bit hectic and uh, we're starting to really get into the thick of things. I'm trying to establish my website and work on just other projects on top of this. And also I need to recharge my creative batteries, so Crap Guide to D&D will take a little bit of a hiatus just so I can rest. In the meantime, I'll be uploading uh, some other videos, maybe an overly edited here and there, maybe a CCC. I know Black Desert Online has been sitting on the shelf for a little while now. I guess you can expect that in the next couple of weeks. But don't worry, Crap Guide will return. Just uh, watch for the little bow and arrow in your sub box. Now that's the Q&A done, and uh, if you are only interested in the Crap Guides to D&D, or just being a passive viewer and watching my videos and, and just supporting me that way, that's great, I appreciate you. This is, for all intents and purposes, the end of the video. You can stop watching now because right now I'm about to plug a Patreon, and it's nothing special. It is the same thing as every other Patreon, so you can leave now if, you, if you're not interested. Everybody out? Only the people who care about the Patreon stuff still around? Okay, cool. So yes, like every other YouTuber out there alive, I have a Patreon. Now, what I want to say is not to donate so I can make better stuff, or that I can make stuff faster, or that I can make more crap guides, or anything like that, because that's not going to happen. That's not to say that your contribution won't help in some way. Even the tiniest amount. If 1% of my subscribers donated a single dollar each, I can possibly live off of that. Some of you may already know this, but I am currently in my senior year of college and will be graduating soon. My tuition is not fully paid off, and I do not currently have a job. Aside from the live streams and YouTube, if you count that. But that doesn't mean I'm going to make this my full-time job. It's not that I don't want it to be, I just don't know that I do want it to be. Trends, interests, and the internet are always changing, so I worry that putting so many eggs in this basket might be a bad idea if I trip and drop it one day. In which case, a more traditional salary job would be more secure. I'm just not sure either way. That's why for now, I feel like I'm going to have it be temporary until July. At that point, it will have been one month since I graduated college and should be enough time for me to find a quote unquote real job. And I should be able to come to a decision on whether or not I want to continue doing this exclusively as a viable means of income or not. That's all to say that donations are not and never will be required to make all the things I want to make. because. I wanted to make a lot, and I would do it regardless. Even before the channel exploded, I have been making a variety of things to feed my creative needs. You can check my personal channel for some examples of that. I want to make videos, I want to make music, I want to make animations, I want to make games even, if the opportunity arises. And I'm saying this because you should not donate if you are only expecting more videos like the crap guides, because I'm not going to be only making those forever. I want to make a bunch of stuff. I want to make a variety of stuff. Take a look at my past work. Take a look at what I am capable of making. Everything I make. Not just the stuff that you like, but the stuff that you're not too interested in either. And that you should only donate. Only, only, only if you are okay with that kind of content. Now, I do try to keep in mind what 
people are interested in too. It's like a 60-40 ratio of what I want to make and what I think people are interested in. And sometimes the two overlap, but with such a variety of content, sometimes some of it may not always be up to snuff in one way or the other. Maybe you might not be interested or not, might not be very good. I also won't be doing tiers because I would like everyone who's interested in my work to have it available without a paywall. Things may change in the future if I can figure out a way to give higher paying patrons their money's worth in a way that I am both comfortable with and capable of providing, but for now I think I'm just gonna leave it as it is. With all that said, if you are still interested in supporting my work financially through this, I mean aside from those of you who already are generous enough to donate on Twitch, then I am indescribably grateful. It is an absolute dream to be able to do what you love and are passionate about and get paid for it. Which is why I feel so guilty since it doesn't feel like work to me, it just feels like I'm just having fun. But anyway, yeah, sorry to get all soapboxy on you, I just want to be as transparent and honest as possible. I don't want to make any false promises, least of all when other people's money is involved. Thank you everyone who stuck around for that whole spiel. More videos out soon, I'll get back to the crap guides uh, once I recharge my, my brain batteries. And thank you.